Uh, so we're here to talk about salt. If you don't want to talk about salt, you should leave now. Um, <laughs> we uh, uh, are uh, uh, really fortunate to have two wonderful panelists. At the far end is uh, Mark Kurlansky, um, who I thought I knew because of one word title books, like <laughs> what, cod, salt, 1968, I assume 1968 is one word. Uh, but in fact, has many other books with uh, multiple syllables in the title. Um, <laughs> and before that, he was uh, a far off, 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 off Broadway playwright, and then uh, uh, international uh, journalist for many, many years uh, before he settled down in 1991 to bring us his wisdom in books. He's written this terrific book um, on salt. Uh, and to my immediate left is Judy Salerno, uh, who was a classmate of mine um, at Harvard. Uh, she was a serious one. Um, and then <laughs> went on to an illustrious career at the NIH, uh, where she uh, rose to be the deputy director of the National Institutes of Aging. And then recently, to our great loss and uh, the Institute of Medicine's great gain, she is now the chief operating officer of the Institute of Medicine, which means that she decides what they're going to investigate, um, and uh, has a great responsibility actually for disseminating. And so some of the tr great transformations you've seen on the Institute of Medicine in terms of making things much more accessible to the public um, are due to her uh, brilliant insights about uh, the fact that what they do should not be reserved for pinheads and propeller heads, as my brother would say. We're going to talk about salt. Now, um, it has become a very big issue. Um, there's a lot of it in our diet. Um, a lot of it in uh, prepared foods, whether it's more or less than as been over history, is something that Mark's going to talk about a little bit. Uh, many people believe salt has some serious health consequences, exactly what those consequences are, whether restricting your salt has a difference or not is something we're going to talk about, what the right level uh, of salt is. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, we're certainly going to get to a discussion about what to do uh, and whether other experiments uh, have worked. So to kick us off, um, I'm going to ask Mark to talk a little bit about, uh, as it were, um, the history of salt. How does it get into our food? Why do we have it? Why do we like it? Um, and maybe you can talk in that context about whether we've got more or less of it than we have over history. Okay. So you're not going to tell us what the difference is between pinheads and propeller heads. As far as my brother says, they're both the same thing. All you right. Know, it just depends whether he wants to insult me or someone else. All right. <laughs> I'm the pinhead. I just felt that needed some clarification. Um, salt, uh, for all of human history until the early 20th century, was one of the most important commodities in the world. Um, it became important when a society moved from hunter-gatherer to agriculture, um, partly because um, if you raise animals or, for that matter, crops, you need salt, um, but also because human beings cannot live without salt, and hunter-gatherers who are on an all-meat diet get all the salt they need, but people who live on things like grain and vegetables don't. <coughs> so then there was a need for salt. So Every country, every society, every culture in the world has some salt story, either about the salt they produce or how they manage to get salt um, in spite of not having any, not producing any. Um, it, it's an interesting question that be because we're so uh, increasingly concerned with the amounts of salt in our diet, it, it kind of raises the question of, um, you know, are we really eating more salt? I mean, it's widely believed that we're eating more salt. We're clearly eating more salt than we were eating 20 years ago. But are we eating more salt than people ate in earlier times? Um, uh, and you, get, you can't say for certain because um, <coughs> it wasn't measured then. They didn't have a Food and Drug Act. <laughs> you know, there wasn't good labeling. Um, <coughs> but we do know that um, an enormous amount of food was salted before refrigeration. It was the primary way of preserving food. Um, and from November to April in most countries in the world, almost everything you ate was salted. And um, 
people nowadays have a sort of a false idea of what that meant uh, because we still eat these salty products like bacon, for example. Um, but what do we do with bacon? We put it in the refrigerator. You know, you have to put it in the refrigerator because it's not salty enough. Before there was refrigeration, bacon was really, really salty. Um, and so were fish and so was butter and um, uh, so there was a, a great deal of salt eaten. Um, it's interesting that salt has these two aspects. Um, one is that you die if you don't eat enough of it, and the other is that you can die if you eat too much of it. <laughs> um, and it's kind of interesting that when salt was valuable, we were focused on making sure we didn't die from not eating enough of it. And since it's become economically worthless, <laughs> we're much more concerned with eating too much of it. Um, also, advances in medicine have something to do with that. Um, but salt was extremely valuable, and um, the whole science of the whole field of geology was largely centered on trying to We need a doctor? Katie, are we okay? You look so concerned. <laughs> yeah, it's just a design flaw. It's like all right. I think we're you're okay? Are you okay, sir? Okay. Just give us a thumbs up and we're ready to go. I've okay. certainly never been so completely upstaged. The whole science of geology was largely centered around trying to understand uh, what salt was, where it came from, how to find more of it. And then in the early 20th century, it was discovered that there was a relationship between salt and oil. Um, and then uh, there was this real drive to find uh, um, salt to find oil. Um, and we ended up in the process of trying to find oil, discovering that there's a lot more salt around than anybody ever realized. Um, and so between that and the invention of uh, refrigeration so that food didn't need to be preserved as much, um, salt um, uh, tremendously lost its value. Uh, nowadays, to be in the salt business, you have, to, um, you have to be selling huge, huge amounts of salt to make any money on it. Um, and Salt is um, uh, not thought of, I mean, it was kind of counterintuitive when I wrote the book. Nobody ever thought of salt. It was completely forgotten that salt was ever thought of as anything that was worth anything. Um, less than 10% of the salt produced today is eaten. Uh, the largest single use of salt is for icing rolls, so de-icing rolls, excuse me. Um, But that being said, um, we eat a lot of salt. Um, and I mean, why do we eat so much salt? Why is so much salt put in our food? Why is so much salt put in commercial industrial food? Because we like it. Um, there's also a huge amount of sugar put in for the same reason we like it. And if you look at history, you'll see that throughout history, we have always particularly loved things that had both salt and sugar in them. So there's nothing new about that. Um, the, uh, um, what's new is um, partly that we have a lot more medicine to look at this than we, ha than we had before. And the other thing is that we have a lot more industrial food so that you know, we can be eating salt without realizing it. 
But why do we love salt so much? Um, I mean, you could say because it tastes good. We'll leave it at that. But I, <coughs> I, I, I have a pet theory um, because I've talked to people whose health was in serious danger. They became very sick from salt deficiency. Um, most of these people were men um, <coughs> serving in the Pacific in World War II. And they would get very sick. And they would go to the medical officer. And he would give them uh, salt pills. And then they would be all right. But what was interesting when I talked to these people is none of them had any sense of a lack of salt. The way if you were dying of thirst, you would crave water. Uh, they, they were all astounded when they heard that their problem was a lack of salt. You get no, you get no sense of that. So this is my theory, based on nothing at all. I think that because I'm, a, uh, I'm very much a, a follower of uh, evolutionary biology, and I think that in evolution for survival, it was built in for us to love salt, to make sure we ate it and didn't die of a lack of salt. Now, um, it could be argued that it's swung too much the other way. So Judy, maybe you could tell us <coughs> what the health consequences are of too much salt and what the right level ought to be. Well, I think that we don't know exactly what the right level is. We know what an adequate amount of salt is, and we know what too much is. And we get too much. And the reason why it's a medical issue, it's a serious public health problem, because the intake of salt is directly related to the development of hypertension. Now, as we age, our blood pressure increases. So you might think that this is a problem for um, older people, um, for hypertensive people who are already established, hypertensive diabetics. But in fact, our taste for salt is acquired at a very young age. In fact, there have been some studies that show that even at four months of age, that you can, that an infant can distinguish uh, salt and, and shows a, a liking for it. So we grow up with salt, and salt, I don't think we have come to grips with the fact that it's an acquired taste, that we, uh, we uh, I love salt, uh, I love potato chips, um, and I couldn't imagine a potato chip without salt. However, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous, and we've established from a very early age that this is what good food tastes like. So we, it's very hard to say no salt. And it, but in fact, if we took away a salt shaker from every restaurant, every cafeteria, and every home, we'd still be only decreasing the amount of salt in our diet by about 5%, because the overwhelming majority of salt, over 75%, comes from food that's already processed. It's in the food supply. And in order to make any headway in solving the problem of too much salt in our diet, we have to really address the problem of the food supply. And that makes it a public health issue and not, a, not only a problem of individual taste. So can uh, I just want to go back. So two th or three quarters plus of the salt in our diet is from processed food. Um, and uh, I have heard that we've increased the amount of salt we take over the last 30 or 40 years by 50%. Is that about right? Well, and how much salt actually are we consuming, out of curiosity, on average? We're in the food. We're we're um, consuming about 3,300 milligrams, which is about a teaspoon and a half a day, which doesn't seem like a lot, but we should. That's about 50 percent more than what the experts agreed should be the right amount. And that that, is, that assumes that you're eating a fair amount of industrial food. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, if you grow and make your own food, but, you know, I, I last week I tried to um, count the amount of salt in three days in my diet, and I watched my salt. I have high blood pressure, and I couldn't get it down below the level where it should be because I eat in the cafeteria, and I picked up takeout take food on the way home. So it's really, you know, it's yeah. really uh, impossible to manage. 
Um, so oh, it, so I want to ask you one. You said it's hard to know what the right amount is, but we know what's too much. Uh, what is, on the other hand, you said we're eating 3,300 and we should probably be eating half. So how do we think about these numbers? We, the U.S. government used to say it was 2,400 milligrams. Uh, the World Health Organization said 2,000. Uh, we recently, the U.S. government, came out at 1,500. How's the average person supposed to know? How am I supposed to know? And I'm, you know, I'm supposed to be a doctor, or so they tell me. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you can't. And that's why we have to address the food supply issue, because it's the only way to really get at um, a adequate, yet not over going overboard and since it's it, the there's a real dose response relationship between what how much salt you take and how high your blood pressure goes we know when you're up in that range of hypertension and prehypertension and it's it's predictable but but, so but also isn't it a question of the individual some people process salt some people have better functioning kidneys and process salt better than other people. Right? Absolutely. We know, for instance, African Americans have more of a, a, a problem with salt issues, uh, okay. diabetic, um, older people. But there is no way to find out who those people right. are. Right. So, so from a population you know, basis, important. getting salt down is important, whereas any one of us in the audience, it may not be an issue for us. Yes. There's, uh, there Unless are, you're there older, over 50. There, there, there are people who can eat salt with impunity. Yes, mm -hmm. but I defy anyone to find a test, an easy test, where we could establish, establish that, yeah. that. So that's, that's the conundrum. And you said that we um, entrain or uh, define how much salt we like in our diet early on. Um, a, how early, and can we untrain ourselves? Oh, we absolutely can untrain ourselves. I think there's no question that it's a, an acquired taste, um, but that it has to be done gradually. You don't notice when you take something out of the food supply when you do it gradually. Um, you know, I stopped at home salting the food. We don't never, I never salt, add that extra salt, even though it's only 5%. Um, my family never noticed it. It just over time, that's what they got accustomed to. And it's, that's the way we have to go. We have right. to do it carefully and gradually. And is 5% the sort of imperceptible change level, 10%? I, th I think it's more 10%. When you, people who market low sodium foods, it's more like a little over 10%, 10 to 20% where you, know, you reduce them. But, but if, if you- So if it's if 10%, if uh, let me just, yeah. I just wanna, hopefully get all of us on the same line. So if it's 5% a year to get cut our salt consumption in half would take 10 years. If it's 10% a year, it'll take five years. That's if we turn the spigot tomorrow and everyone, all the manufacturers did it. So it's still a long-term change. Absolutely. And has no any, any country achieved, su been successful in this? Well, I think there have been um, greater efforts than have been launched in this country in Great Britain, for example. I'm not sure that. And that have they bought the blood pressure down? Um, because we really, in the end, don't care about how much salt we have in our diet. Exactly, we care about the hypertension. Exactly, and what it leads to consequences of. Uh, and have they brought the hypertension down? You know, I, I, I'm not sure how well they've done. And it's been, uh, um, I think, within the past five, six years. So um, I imagine that we might not see the changes in the rates of hypertension for a generation, possibly. Why is that? Well, because the, we have to do it so gradually, and I'm thinking it might be 10 years, it might be more, um, that you know we have to take baby steps along the way and look at what we're doing and see what we've accomplished along the way and, and sort of feel our way through what the right amount out of the food su supply would be. Um, Mark, I wanna go back to you. Why over the last 30, 40 years have we had this tremendous increase in salt in the processed food world? Um, because we've had an increase in processed food. Uh, so it was I always in processed food, it's just that processed I food makes up I more of our I, diet. I believe that it was always in processed food. Um, and in fact, even going back before processed foods, you know, whenever there was somebody trying to mass market a product, the way to do it was to make it salt and sugar, you know. 
Um, I've had it in I, I, I experimented on my poor daughter. This is, yeah. this is what happens when you have the misfortune. Did she to give be informed to consent? To, to be <laughs> born to you know, a foodie intellectual, you get experimented on as a baby. Um, it was very clear that, you know, of the, the four tongue tastes, salt, sour, bitter, sweet, um, salt was uh, uh, the, the first, salt, by the way, is in formula. Um, salt was the first one that she was attracted to. And she was over a year old before she discovered sweet. Once she discovered it, she was into it in a big way. Yeah. But she was into salt far before sweet. Sour was much later, and at the age of 10, she still hasn't. You know, this is why kids don't like vegetables. They, they don't get bitter. And the, the some, some scientists think that they have their bitter receptors are too good, so the bitter tastes much more bitter to kids than um, huh. and to, to adults. But of, of those four tastes on the tongue, the one that we are just first and most easily attracted to seems to be salt. Um, and so, you know, they know that, <laughs> the people who are trying to mass market food. And so you think the growth of industrial food over the last uh, 30 or 40 years and really coming just more into the diet rather than uh, uh, yeah. more into food? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we used to cook a lot more. We used to, our diets used to be based a lot more on home cooking. Um, and, uh, you know, they aren't like, like you said, you know, you, you get carry out food and you get industrial food and snack food and, and you end up eating uh, more salt and it's a bigger business. I, I don't, you know, I might be wrong about this. I never researched it, but I, I, I don't believe that they're putting more salt in. I think they always put a lot of salt in. We're just, they're making more of it and we're eating more of it. The, the sodium density in food that's the amount of sodium per thousand calories, hasn't changed over time. It's just that we're eating more food. So we're consuming more calories, and more calories in processed food has more salt. So, so it, it I mean, there, there are two changes here. I mean, one is to ask the food manufacturers, uh, Stuart here and others, to reduce the amount of salt that they're putting in their food. I guess there are three. To reduce the amount of salt they're putting in the food. We could ask the American population to eat less of that processed food and to eat more other foods. And I guess the third is to change our salt formulation so we don't put as much salt, but we still have that salty taste. Well, you know, I, I've, I've noticed because I've written about cod, you know, salt cod, that societies like the Basques, who have a very strong tradition of eating salt cod, have a tremendous palate for salt. Basque food is very salty, all of it. Um, and I think that salt is that kind of thing where, you know, the, the more you get that taste, the more, the more you want it. I never ate much salt till I did the damn salt book. <laughs> and then I picked <laughs> up all these, you know, designer salts from all these places I was writing about. So I started putting them on things that I never <laughs> salted before. <laughs> Gray salt and sea salt right. and all this. But, you know, we find if you compare salt and sugar, the two things that go together in a lot of processed food, we have a lot of different ways we can substitute for sugar. We have the Splendas and you know everything else out there, but we don't have really good substitutes for salt. And it's because our salt receptors are so specific, and it's not you know right. it's a it's a finer. There, there is some attempt out there at a salt substitute, right? And yeah, it's not well, any good. you know the 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 one that's been used most is uh, potassium chloride. Yeah, and it, and it's just it. Most people find it, it gives a bitter taste to food. Right. Well, what about this uh, sort of crystallization of salt, making finer uh, crystals and stuff that, at least if the rumors are true, uh, can reduce the salt needed for us to have the same sensation by about thirty percent. Is that likely? Is that something we ought to pursue more? I know the manufacturers are going for it. You know, it's 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 the larger crystals. Um, the smaller crystals have more surface area and more likely to dissolve and get into food. So, you know, that's why some people say sea salt is better for you right. than table salt. Not necessarily true, but some types of sea salt by the same amount of volume as table salt have forty p up to forty percent less sodium. Sodium being the chief component. Because of the salt. crystals are larger. Yeah, yeah. it's a volume. Right. Thing. 
Okay. But you still taste it as salty at the same level. Um, I would imagine so. All right. <laughs> I would think so. I mean, it's, an, it's an interesting thing that I, I experimented when I had all these different kinds of salt. Um, most salts, if they're white, not red salt and gray salt and that stuff, but white salt, it's sodium chloride, and it should all taste the same. And it doesn't. And I think, I mean, what your senses tell you is that some salt tastes saltier than other salt. And I think that is all a function of the size and shape of the crystals and our, the way we perceive it, not anything real. So there might be a way of manipulating the salt to make us perceive the same level of saltiness, but actually have less of the stuff that could cause bad health. Is that? Yeah, you just yeah. produce it slower. It's the crystals, the, 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 the more slowly you evaporate, uh, you allow crystals to form, the larger the crystal. Okay. Um, one last thing I want to do before we go to audience questions, and I hope you have uh, a lot of questions. Uh, two last things. Judy is, um, uh, are these interventions, first of all, do we have good proven interventions to actually reduce salt besides just trying to take it out of the food system? Uh, and the second is, um, is, there, is, is this sort of cost effective? Uh, is this something that we really should have an investment in? Um, and if we do, uh, from a health standpoint, uh, why is it so hard to get there? Yeah, well, I think we've, we've showed in clinical trials that if you do cut back on salt, in, but in a very controlled situation, you can reduce blood pressure, no question even with the, the little bit of extra salt we use. But I think it's, uh, it's important that we, we think about um, not only reducing it or asking manufacturers to reduce it, but, but saying it should be reduced you know, as a, s a standard in food that is um, produced for mass consumption. I, I, there was a statement by uh, Unilever in 2009 which said that they wanted a level playing field because when you go into a store and you see low salt, a lot of people walk the other direction. Uh, it's not, it's perceived as not being good tasting food. So if we, if it were the industry standard, then we would have much more success. And how do we get to the industry? Uh, it's the only way to get to industry standard, I guess, regulation. And if that's true, how do we do that? And, or is it possible to get there voluntarily? Well, we've been doing, we've been, you know, it's 1969 was the first time the U.S. government suggested that we ought to reduce our, our salt in our diet for health reasons. And uh, we haven't had much success for 40 some odd years. So uh, I can only, um, I can only attribute that to the fact that, the, that we were aiming at the wrong audience. We were aiming at the consumers. We weren't aiming at where the salt is. We didn't go where the money was. Okay, uh, we have a chance for questions, and uh, why don't we start here. You have to use the microphone because, as you might have heard, they're recording it. Please stand up, if you don't mind, but don't fall. <laughs> Um, I think in the next session we can hear from the Walmart <laughs> folks about that. But it's it, it was a tremendous thing that they did. They re they they're and not only their home their um, store brand, but also brands um, that they their suppliers they've asked them to cut back, and that's the way we're going to get there. There's <laughs> yeah. Well, they have done a lot of stuff in the diet. Yeah. Become very interested in providing healthier things uh, to their uh, customers, and this reduction in salt is one of them. So, Stuart, you uh, were next. Don't want to put you on the spot there, Stuart. <laughs> but how much salt is in everything you sell? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you do. So, you know, so Olympic athletes and that sort of, you know, no, I mean, people who do, um, it, you're, it's the, the, the levels uh, that are recommended are for a person who might have 
go out on a hot day but not exercise every day and have that, uh, you know, strenuously. And, um, so it is, it is different. Well, natural. Well, if you don't eat processed food, it is. It's, it's what you use in your cooking and what you sprinkle on your food. So here's the breakdown that I've uh, – 77 percent on the average American is from processed foods. The dominant amount there is from uh, breads and uh, baked goods that you buy. And meat. You got 12% out of your diet that's in natural stuff, 5% added in cooking, and 6% or whatever the residual is added at the table or goes as flint. Um, but Assuming you know, you if eat you eat meat, yeah. right, if you eat meat, you get enough. You right? only need about 500 milligrams a day for – Your kidney will yeah. regulate yeah. the rest. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, right. That's why hunter-gatherers didn't worry about salt. Right. Is that Okay. No, no, meat and fowl, uh, meat and fowl. B uh, muscle has a lot. Yeah. All right, we're just going around the room. We'll get to you. Well, um, I'm sure you're referring to what's happening in New York City. So they're not only posting calories, they're posting um, sodium content. And I think the, the jury is out on uh, whether that, that has an effect. Perhaps with some people it, it does. But uh, I think we need some time for this to settle in. And it's, it's s started in New York, but it's being picked up all around the country. I do think there is a situation where we get a lot of salt in those meals for many of the reasons that Mark has mentioned, which is we like it, they want to sell more, uh, adding salt is a way of getting us to – and they don't actually, especially if it's not a chain restaurant, they don't uh, actually know how much salt they put in. They themselves, the chefs and <coughs> others. So that can itself be a problem and one of – I do think one of the advantages of New York uh, uh, reg is to make pe pe the people who are preparing food who aren't uh, in the sort of uh, uh, fast food space begin to think about that. Well, what are they I don't think I, – I, I think what Judy said is we're going to – first of all, yes, there is a, a move to, but we're going to see. And um, maybe we can talk about uh, the issue of if not – if everyone doesn't do it, uh, what the consequences are for he who does in a second. I, I, I would be very surprised, though, to discover that eating in restaurants was a major source of uh, – an excessive salt intake. If uh, 1,500 is your standard, you'd be very surprised. Uh, I mean, I, I it, it, right now, at 3,300, that's true. But if you come down to 1,500, it's a different story. But, but do you think that restaurants put more salt in food than people do in their homes? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. You do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's Corby Cummer, a professional <laughs> critic. Oh, that's a cynic. Ooh. <laughs> and what restaurants do you run in uh, Aspen? <laughs> that's why the pretzels are there at the bar. <laughs> ah. Yes. Wow, that is cynical. Used, All right. Used to be Stand caviar. Huh? Used to be caviar. In New York bars used to have caviar. And that became and that became food. rare. And, right? that, and now it, we get pretzels. And, and that accounts for <laughs> <oy> <laughs> does that account for oysters too? <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> Tell us who you are. <laughs> you 
Yeah, I mean, we need potassium, and there are standards for, for potassium as well in your diet, and there is, a, there is an exchange that goes on at the cellular level of sodium and potassium, and that's why it's considered a substitute without going into biochemistry about it. But, um, you know, you can't get too much potassium in your diet as well. Um, so I think, you know, it's everything, there's moderation, and, and it hasn't been successful. As uh, in your f in when you're cooking, yeah, yes, yes, she can. I don't know the and maybe Judy does the exact amount, but I think if you had 3,300 uh, milligrams of potassium chloride, that would be pretty toxic. That would be pretty pretty intense. So you can do some do of it, but probably not at that level. Yeah. Also, you need some sodium somewhere along the line. Yeah, <laughs> 500 <laughs> milligrams, That's which it. is pretty low. <laughs> Over there physician from New York, and uh, we just heard reiterated downstairs by uh, Dr. Dean Ornish that 75% of our health care costs come from chronic illnesses, and a lot of it, of course, is contributed by salt and fats. And uh, I just met with a gentleman from the San Diego government who said that 50% um, of the kids in San Diego are wildly obese. So I guess my question speaks to what uh, Dr. Emanuel or you were bringing up, can this be, does this have to be legislated or can you really get people to make uh, significant lifestyle changes? I don't think you'll get people to make significant lifestyle changes unless it's over 25, 50, 75 years. So again, where does, uh, you know, where do you see the government's role in this? Judy, you wanna take a crack? Well, I, Since I would You're out of the government now and I'm, I'm not. I'm out of the government and I, I, um, I would certainly be in favor of uniform standards across the, the food industry of all sorts. Uh, I, I, I just think that's the only way we're gonna get there. And um, you know, I, I, we've tried voluntary standards and it disadvantages some people who put other kinds of food, in the, you know, that the low sodium foods in the marketplace. And we just can't do that. You can't, you can't have those kinds of um, choices because we already know that we've acquired that taste for salt. C can so I follow I up to, yeah. so let's just talk about this acquired taste of salt. And so one of the arguments I hear and, and is if everyone doesn't do it, then those people who, e even if they lower it but don't advertise it, they just take it down, people will naturally figure out that the other one ta still tastes better and then go to the bad, a as it were, the actor who hasn't joined on the voluntary. Is that right, not right? Yeah, it, it, there's an interesting uh, phenomenon, though, is that if you take salt out of food and you give people a salt shaker to use ad lib so they can have as much salt as they want, they only put back right. a, a fraction of what was taken out. So we could, we could take salt out of food and put salt shakers everywhere and still be more successful at reducing our sodium. Let, let, let me also push back, uh, and I having worked in this space now for two years, and, and I think, I don't know, read every study, but read a lot of them. I mean, one of the things we sort of glibly say is, well, it's you know chronic illness, chronic illness, result of lifestyle, all we gotta do is change our lifestyle. It's the, all we, the only thing we have to do is change our lifestyle. Uh, I just ask you, how many of you have made a New Year's resolution about changing your lifestyle, which you failed at? Okay, <laughs> everybody, right? There's nothing so difficult as changing your lifestyle. So we shouldn't be cavalier about what that means. Changing what you eat, changing how much you exercise, or, or changing whether you drink or not, a lot of that stuff is the hardest things we have to do in life. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Judy, part of what Judy is saying is, look, we gotta make, uh, we have a phrase for it which is a little cavalier, but making the healthy choice the easy choice, which is if you're surrounded by all this salty stuff and that's what you're doing, it, it's just easy to do that. So we have to surround people by all that other stuff, and so that they don't have to think about it. But maybe not. Back there. Hi, I'm Jennifer um, with the Baker Scholars from New Orleans. And I, I found that a lot of behavioral changes come from a concern about y how you look and how you feel. And I have a brother who's actually cut out almost all of the salt in his diet, like all the salt that he can control. And he's a med school student at U Chicago. And it's over uh, the belief that cutting out salt can make him look better and <laughs> less swollen. So I was just look I was just wondering, is there any correlation between eating salt and how you look? 
I don't know, but you should have seen me before I cut out full. <laughs> 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 I really, do, I really have no idea, but it's an interesting hypothesis. At least we can lie to people about that, right? <laughs> Over there. And then we'll come down to the front here. Don't worry. We're going to try to get everyone in. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joni Fabry. I, I guess I've got a couple of comments rather than questions. Um, one has to do a little bit with the size of the grains of salt you're talking about and removing salt from the food. I think... I think I find that I taste more salt if it's in contrast to something brined, so that if a meat is brined, you sort of lose the, the overall sense that something is really salty, and if you salt it on top, you don't realize you're, you're gaining more salt, so that sprinkling on crystals of salt on a s salted egg cookie or on a piece of meat, you really taste the salt more just as you taste the sweet more, so that I think that's one of the reasons removing, you know, removing salt from the table and leaving salt bakers enable or, or and having larger grains of salt perhaps, you know, works works that well. Um, Can we ask an expert to respond? If you yeah, would pass please. that. Uh, that Ms. Bradley, who's an expert in the tasting of salt. You're actually kind of describing why people think that potato chips have more sodium than a piece of bread because it's the salt that's on top of the chip that's sprinkled on. And then when it hits your palate, it saturates your receptors. And so actually there's technology that we've announced that we're looking at the molecular structure of traditional salt, salt crystals. When you just change the shape, you actually get, a, you can lower the sodium by about 35%, but you even have a sharper kind of salt hit if that's what you like. Can you tell us who we is? This is PepsiCo. <laughs> <laughs> can we, you, you pass the uh, mic forward there? I'm Sherry Felson, a uh, longtime salt user, grew up in the Midwest where I think we didn't have a lot of fresh vegetables. It was always canned or frozen, whatever. Developed a tremendous uh, taste for salt. Now I find that when you do go to restaurants where there isn't as much salt, I live in California, you know, they try to be healthy everywhere in Northern California. I wind up eating more trying to get that you know, like an addict or something, you try to get that salt fix. And I would think that as far as obesity is concerned, there are probably a lot of other people out there who feel the same way, who are eating more to get that taste. Can you comment about that? Okay. Mark. Judy, Mark? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, um, when before refrigeration, when uh, food was really salty, um, people weren't eating more. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think that maybe what you're I experiencing is, is more of a withdrawal kind of thing, that you're, you're used to having it and then you don't, and so you're... you're well, that's not I don't know. I would just say, for God's sake, put some salt on and yeah. eat less. <laughs> Pick up the salt I think shaker. obesity <laughs> would probably be worse. <laughs> I don't think there's any um, concern that fast food <laughs> restaurants are, are cut cutting back, back on the salt. You, a big a Big Mac has over 200 milligram, 2,000, excuse me, close to 2,000 milligrams of salt in it. So if you, I, I, I mean, one of the things, uh, if coming out of this meeting, uh, just read the label of many things that you eat and look at the nutrition facts and just focus in on the sodium. I think you quickly become astounded as to how much salt, you know, you just go to a can of soup or you go to the cereal, how much they actually contain. I mean, the average can of soup, it's about 700 milligrams just in the eight ounces that you're supposed to eat. It's just a s huge, uh, shockingly high uh, amount in a relatively small uh, amount of food that you end up consuming. Um, and so I think the, the withdrawal phenomena, um, I, this is the partially the acculturation, uh, you know, 
know, it does take time to redo your palate. Uh, uh, I think we have to, um, people have to learn to look at labels for more than low fat or, you know, uh, other calories that, that we have to really be instructed as to what we should be looking for and what's the right amount. Yeah, because they've gotten very tricky about that labeling and there's all sorts of hidden things. Uh, you were going to correct something back there, bring us back to the truth, Corby? So this was when I was at Campbell's Soup. So there's been a lot. I, I, there's been a lot of work done in sodium and trying to look at the behavior of giving someone something that's seasonably appropriate versus having people totally react low in salt. And there's so many research projects that we did that showed that people traditionally just piled it on more. In fact, so one of the the innovations that my big idea that I would love to do is reinvent the salt shaker, so that you actually when you you salt, you actually have some kind of meter that lets you know what the milligram unit is, as opposed because that's traditionally what happened, is the way that the salt shaker is, when we watched the behavior and then measured it, it was because they were dumping a lot, right? And then the, the temperature also changes the perception of the amount. Hotter, better? <laughs> All right, come up here. Got two purples. Go. <laughs> um, thank you for talking up, about please. this topic. And I was going to say, I actually carry a bag of salt in my purse. This might be controversial. I'm a salt lover. And what I think the difference is is between the refined and unrefined. This is a fleur de sel salt. I like the mineral salt. I put a little salt in the ice cream because I add less sweetener when I make homemade ice cream. So, and I also grew up on a farm. I'm an MD, have a food company and had farm and I had a gerbil or a rabbit. Did anybody have those? And you put the little salt lick in the taste, right? So my question is, it's I really think it's a processed salt issue versus a unrefined salt because as animals, that little gerbil didn't go crazy on the salt. The cow doesn't go crazy on the salt. We're taking the trace minerals out. So uh, my thoughts are, what do you think about if we focus, I notice my face bloats in the morning if I've had table salt at a restaurant but when I use sea salt and get my food unsalted in the restaurant, I wake up and my skin looks different. Well, an a animals. Maybe it goes back to the thin medical student uh, <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> Good point. A animals tend to uh, eat the salt they need and not to. OD. Oh, oh, right, right. It's, it's not that they're having better salt, it's that they have a better lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, if we got 77% of our uh, salt in processed foods, it's unlikely we're going to get the unrefined uh, in that food chain. And to the extent that that's a dominant uh, player, uh, I think that's. Well, maybe we should get people to stop loving salt. <laughs> Bruce Berger, uh, question. There are societies who don't have refrigeration today that are the boss who have a much saltier diet than we do. Have there been scientific studies or health studies within those societies comparing them against our society? <laughs> what, what is your experience with that? Well, I, I, I actually wondered this about, because I read about BAPS a lot. And you know, I, I have noticed that they eat these very salty diets. So I, I, I looked into this and uh, to my surprise, you know, because BAPS study everything BAPS, so you're gonna you can always find out with bats. Um, bat, bat, bats don't seem to have uh, uh, more high blood pressure than other people. I can't explain that. They clearly do eat more salt. Well but, ma but maybe, you know, maybe a good bacalao dish is better for you than a bag of potato chips. Well, that's an Italian dish, too. I right. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, uh, any cross-cultural studies uh, on salt? Because I don't think it's just the bats. I mean, you know. Soy sauce has a huge amount huge, of yeah. salt. Yes. Well, I, th I think that the it's probably, I, I don't know that literature, but um, probably, you know, our obesity is more complex than salt and calories, that it's the, the types of food we eat and the, you know, the, um, as we've heard from a number of speakers over the past few days, that it's 
it's a um, it's something that is really fundamentally um, we, we need some fundamental changes in the way we approach fees. But I think, look, one of the other issues, at least certainly if you think way back when, how long people lived was a major, we've had a major shift over the 20th century. So hi hypertension and the consequence of hypertension, stroke, uh, uh, cardiac disease, renal disease, kidney disease, we didn't have those problems before. They died sooner than that. So the whole issue of whether it was a serious problem, you know, and if you go to developing countries where they don't have refrigeration, the average lifespan there is still, uh, in many of them, under 50. Uh, so, you know, you have an intersection of several things determining, uh, you know, health and lifespan there that might, might undermine uh, the study you're looking at. But for the Chinese and uh, um, uh, Japanese, uh, we do know that when they change to a Western diet, all those chronic illnesses that we have, they get them too. But they have other things, right, in their diet. Right, well, yeah. oh, right, I mean, definitely con a well, contributor. Yeah. Right, definitely contributor. Where did that mic go? Uh, you had a point, you in the blue dress who are now, okay, if not, right, right, wait, wait. That ma gentleman right next to you. Sorry. I just wanted to comment on what you were saying about labels for a second. I have a doctor who's a salt Nazi. <laughs> and uh, the advice was, first of all, don't believe anything on the front of the can because that's not regulated. So when it says low salt, it may or may not be low salt. Can you comment on that? It, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, but you need to actually look at the label. And when you look at the label, what the doctor said is, if the salt milligrams are higher than the calories per serving, don't buy it. And what you'll see in the store, if you see <laughs> three cans of, uh, of chicken stock, as you said, one will have 700 milligrams. Then there will be one that says low sodium, which has 425 milligrams. And then there'll be one that says no salt added that has 150 milligrams. And you can make a choice if you're buying prepared, you know, whatever to fake as a part of your own meal. You can make a choice to use the lower one and then salt it. It's worked. Uh, it's worked, I know, in terms of my own blood pressure. So, for whatever it's worth. Okay. I'm Pamela Sellers. Uh, a couple of points. Aren't you going to tell us who you work for? You know. No, I'm not. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, first and foremost, how much the consumption of athletic drinks, drinks in general, is playing a role in this. Uh, the next question I have is, is this the new high fructose corn syrup? And if so, are, is there a lobby that will be out there running commercials about how syrup is not bad for you? Oh, well, the Salt oh. Institute is very active yeah. on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and they have, um, when the Institute of Medicine, um, I'm affiliated with, um, came out with strategies last year to reduce sodium in our, our food supply, um, they issued a statement that basically said that we don't have the randomized clinical trials to back this up. And is that and true? We don't have the randomized clinical trials to back this up? Well, um, we, ha we, don't, we have studies around salt usage, but I mean, as somebody suggested, it's kind of like, do we have randomized clinical trials that show that parachutes work? No, 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 no. Cigarette smoking. <laughs> cigarette smoking. You know. uh, no, but uh, cigarette uh, smoking is different because with uh, cigarette smoking, you can show that any amount of cigarette smoking is harmful. Mm -hmm. You know, there really isn't a debate about should you have, you know, a three cigar cigarettes or should you have two packs or, you know, a any smoking I I is harmful. Whereas, as you were saying, with salt, it's a little tricky to determine for each individual how much salt they can have. Um, before we go out, I, I just want to ask you, Judy, can you tell us a little bit more about the issue of regulation um, and what it will 